just acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we, which we meet. Uh, this morning I, I want to talk with you about a stronger, smarter approach to reforming uh, Indigenous education um, and let you in on some of the, the kind of insights that, that actually are the stronger, smarter approach. I recently I've been reading about, um, uh, reading Martin Seligman's work about uh, learned optimism, and I'm very taken by that in its alignment with the stronger, smarter approach. Yet in it, he talked about um, an experiment done some years ago, not by Seligman, but he, he, he was referring to this. And he talked about two dogs in a, in, a circumstance, in a controlled circumstance. I'm not sure you'd get away with it these days, but um, one dog was put in a situation where it was, every time it popped its head up, it would receive a shock. Um, and in the other circumstance, the dog would put its head up and receive a shock. Um, but sometimes it wouldn't. It would put its head up and receive a reward. And what happened was the dog that would lift its head and get a shock every time eventually just didn't bother uh, because it thought there's no point. And um, because it had learned to, it had learned a sense of despair. And I think in many ways, when I reflect on that uh, experiment, it's it's. Uh, in many ways a perfect analogy for uh, what's been happening in, in Aboriginal communities right across Australia. And we see a sense of entrenched despair uh, that is so frustrating uh, and so seemingly intractable. Uh, and in education I, I, I sense that same sense of despair, like, you know, it's almost impossible, we can't do this. But I guess what I'm here, and if you take one message away from me this morning, uh, it is this, that this is something we can do. It is absolutely doable. Because, you know, in many ways, whilst Aboriginal Australia might be like that dog that has not bothered to lift its head anymore, my sense is that white Australia is very much the same and has an entrenched sense of, of um, despair about being able to transform circumstances in Aboriginal communities. But you know what, there's no reason for this sense of despair to exist. Um, it is being done in places. Uh, so with a stronger, smarter approach and, and other approaches, we have moved from a time of, from a time in which we've, <coughs> excuse me, we have moved from a time in which we've hoped for a better future for Aboriginal children to a time in which we now expect it. We have a little way to go. Um, but we have shifted from despair to optimism and I'm really pleased to have been able to play a part in this, I think, uh, because all of my career has been about changing the tide of low expectations of Aboriginal children right across Australia. And um, as an added bonus, I think, to the work that we do at the Stronger Smarter Institute, we, um, one of the nice things is that we've been able to have an effect on poor white children in communities as well because they are just as infected by this toxicity of low expectations about who they are and what they can achieve in life. So some of you will know that some years ago I was the principal of Sherbrooke State School, an Aboriginal community school, the first Aboriginal principal there, and we applied the Stronger Smarter approach. Um, the genesis of it goes way beyond there, and I sort of acknowledge my dear mum um, and the role that, that she played in entrenching this kind of belief about um, rising above expectations. So these are, this gives you some insight into the, the um, Stronger Smarter approach and what we were able to achieve at Sherbrooke School. Um, they're not too bad, uh, going from 62 to 94%, uh, which is pretty good in any school, actually. We didn't cut people's welfare payments um, to force them to go to school. We just made a school that was fun and they wanted to turn up to, where there was intellectual integrity. <laughs> and the rest you can read about for yourself. But I, I, I just want to revisit the point at the bottom and at the point, Bunker, that, that, that you made, is that we didn't go there and we didn't give them a sense of being strong and smart. That existed inside of them already. So over the years, we've come to define the Stronger Smarter approach as this. We say that Stronger Smarter philosophy honours a positive sense of cultural identity. 
that acknowledges and embraces positive community leadership and enabling innovative and dynamic approaches and processes that are anchored by high expectations relationships. And when we talk about high expectations relationships, we say there are those that honour the humanity of others and in so doing acknowledge one's strengths, capacity and human right to immense superior opportunity. So in other words, we're not saying we're coming here to fix you, but we're saying we believe in your capacity. And what we need to do is just create the right conditions around you because you've actually got the capacity to set yourself free. It's about doing things with people, not doing things to people. I'm gonna, from here I just wanna drill down um, on those three kind of pillars, if you like, uh, around a positive sense of identity as opposed to uh, colluding with a negative stereotype. I, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on positive leadership in communities, but I will talk about high expectations leadership. The, um, the question of a sense of Aboriginal identity is really interesting. Um, I, I was so interested in this because I'd grown up with stereotypical views imposed upon me as an Aboriginal child in school, and it was usually pretty stifling. Uh, and fortunately for me, as I sort of intimated earlier, my mum was in, an incredibly strong Aboriginal woman and, and she taught us to stand up for ourselves and to stand up for others. Uh, and she taught us that being Aboriginal was being something great. And this was a message in contrast to what I was receiving in school. I, I'm gonna, the next slide is a little bit confronting, so just get ready for it. I've been fascinated by this um, notion of identity to the extent that I, I wrote a PhD about it. I wanted to articulate or quantify mainstream Australian perceptions of Aboriginal identity, whatever that was, um, and just have a look at that and contemplate its effects on, on children in schools. And I wanted to compare that to Aboriginal perspectives on Aboriginal identity. So I spoke with more than 3,000 people for the purposes of my research. I said, what are some perceptions or some adjectives that mainstream Australia would use to describe Aborigines? And I would say, I'm not after your personal perceptions, but I want to know what you think mainstream Australia, whatever that is, how would they describe um, Aboriginal Australia? And you can appreciate the need for that. At 30 forums, here is a list of the words that came up 30 times. It's not a particularly positive story. And it's just a negative stereotype. It is in no way the truth about who we are as a, as a people. But it's interesting that such a view should be so entrenched. And if in a school's context, uh, this is the kind of dominant perception of Aboriginal people, it's fair to say if much of the workforce, teaching workforce comes out of mainstream Australia, then that's gonna influence the perception of Aboriginal students and their ability to learn and their ability to be exceptional. But here's the thing. As a, as a teacher or as an Aboriginal man, I make a choice. I get a choice in relation to this perception. I can either collude with this perception and make it real or I can set about smashing it to bits. So if I'm a teacher, and I let Aboriginal children run around the room with snotty noses, and I never say to them, go and blow your nose, because we don't have snotty noses in our classrooms, then I'm guilty of colluding with that perception. I'm nurturing it, in fact, and making it seem more realistic than it actually is. If I'm a, if I'm a, um, a teacher and I let Aboriginal children throw chairs around the room and I just do nothing about that, uh, if I let them swear at me as the teacher, with no consequence, without challenging that behaviour and trying to shift it, because somehow that's just what Aboriginal children do in schools, then I'm, I'm colluding with that perception as well. I'm enabling it to be perpetuated. Does that make sense? If I'm a, a teacher and I have five Aboriginal children in my class, over ten, if I, let's say I've got a class of, I've been teaching 10 years, class of 25, there's five children, Aboriginal children in every class I've taught. 
Uh, and I don't scrutinise the data and realise that of the 50 children I've had, 49 of them have become chronically disengaged. And I've never bothered to contemplate why that is the case or I've been content to live with that, that kind of statistic without changing what I do, then I'm guilty of colluding with the perception. But here's the other thing. Young Aboriginal people might be guilty of colluding with this perception as well, thinking that they're reinforcing their sense of cultural identity. And the challenge for us as educators or social workers or whatever role we work in is to get them to understand that when they challenge or, or try to drag down their, their mates or their peers um, and say, oh, you think you're too flash or you, you're trying to be white or you're a coconut, uh, just because the other kid is trying to get their homework done and turn up for school on time, or if, you know, like when they're at Sherbeck, they would bash kids up because they wanted to turn up consistently. Um, those kids should be challenged and made to understand or helped to understand that they're not reinforcing a cultural stereo, uh, they're not reinforcing their cultural identity at all. They're just reinforcing a negative stereotype that's been held out for them. And they've bought into that perception, thinking it's their cultural identity when in fact it's not. And so it's useful for us to explore what is the truth about being Aboriginal and understand that and embrace that and nurture that and engage that as something beautiful to collude with in our schools and classrooms. And so at Sherberg, this is what we talked about as a strong and smart Aboriginal student identity. And in an overall sense, there's nothing particularly Aboriginal about that. But we did want children to, to understand that the strong part in here meant being strong and proud of who we are as a, as a, as a people and understanding the importance of being connected to uh, the, the local landscape and understanding who our family was and where we come from and understanding that, yes, in our community there is dysfunction uh, and there are some challenges. There is alcoholism and all of those sorts of things. But those things exist because they are the legacy of other historical and sociological processes. They are not the legacy of being Aboriginal. I said I'll, I'll go over this really quickly, but I, I, I kind of have come to want to articulate the need for school leadership to embrace positive community leadership. There are, in my, from my perspective, various forms of Aboriginal leadership. There's that which is about being the victim, and that's a kind that nurtures victim status. There's that which is, is about booting the victim, and that booting the victim type leadership can get into very seductive relationships with the political and corporate masters because they'll often tell them what they want to hear. But I would argue that we need to be looking to engage uh, beyond the victim type uh, Aboriginal leadership. The other aspect was about high expectations relationships. And if you think I'm trying to emphasise a particular word there, you might be right. <laughs> high expectations relationships in, we, in which we have the courage to be fair and, and uh, the courage to be firm and the compassion to be fair when we're required. Simultaneously, within the context of the same relationship. Now, if we are just, if all we know in our relationship with Aboriginal Australia is to be fair and to just dangle carrots, and like I say sometimes, we become so open minded about things that our brains fall out. <laughs> that, is a, that is a relationship that is reflective of low expectations and collusion with a negative stereotype. And if we were such in our relationship with Aboriginal people, that we think that the only way to rescue them is to smash them until they conform and cut their parents' welfare payments until they get to school and be like white Australia uh, and just keep smashing them and smashing them, even though it never works. That is a low expectations relationship. In fact, I would argue that you would hardly call that a relationship at all. I'll come back to this point. I want to let you in on some insights that we talk about at the Stronger Smarter Institute. And these are some important questions. Does our professional rhetoric match our day-to-day -day realities? Some years ago I worked in the education department in Queensland um, and we had this wonderful rhetoric, it said, uh, we're committed to providing quality education outcomes for all children. And people will know me, people who know me know I describe this as some very sexy rhetoric. It is so sexy because it's so true. But if you're an Aboriginal man and you've read all of the reports over the last years and you've watched the data, uh, and it's kind of 
articulation of chronic failure, you can't help wondering if there is a kind of sub-clause or caveat after that that's almost unspoken that says, unless they're black, or unless they come from a poor white community, or unless they, they um, uh, come from a single parent family, or whatever. Some more se sexy rhetoric was this principles of effective learning and teaching. And one of them they said, one of the principles said effective learning and teaching shapes and responds to the social and cultural context of the learner. Beautiful, magnificent. But sometimes as teachers, I think we need to reflect and, and wonder about whether or not this rhetoric exists and whether we live by it, whether we actually shape and respond to the co social and cultural context of the learner, or whether we're more intent on just blaming it. And often I think we're guilty of the, the latter. When you think about the social and cultural context, it's quite a nebulous term, and so in our, in our conversations with teachers, school leaders, and uh, community leaders, we make this analogy. We just say the social and cultural context is kind of just like the baggage that kids carry to school. Um, and as somebody who's worked in the education department, the teachers come with a social and cultural context as well. And hands up if you don't know that a teacher who's carrying a lot of baggage, they carry, we all carry baggage. But so do our children. And you know what, the baggage is often different. Um, and it's worth understanding just that very simple kind of analogy. And as a teacher who wants to be effective, it's useful for that teacher to look in here and say, reflect on my own kind of baggage and say, well, you know what, maybe I do have stifled perceptions of Aboriginal children. And maybe that's affecting the relationship that I have with um, the children that I'm working with. And the teacher needs to be able to have a look in this bag. And it doesn't hurt for the student to be able to understand what's in this bag and, and what's important to that teacher. Um, it's probably more important, I would argue, for the teacher to understand what's being carried in this baggage. Whether it's as shallow as had a rough morning and got growled by dad on the way to school, so feeling a little bit grumpy and sad, or whether it's the really deep stuff down there that is that kind of intergenerational trauma of being displaced or, or, or treated badly by white people generations ago that somehow manifested or, or carried over generations and, and made a circumstance difficult to trust white people. It could be as shallow or deep as that. And again, I would argue that it's more incumbent upon the teachers to work harder to understand what's in this bag because they get paid to be in this relationship. And we're the ones who have the sexy rhetoric about shaping and responding to the context. <coughs> so if we're going to have that rhetoric, it's incumbent upon us to have to know that. If you take a, a mainstream white student, the bag probably looks a little bit less like that and a little bit more like this. So here we can assume some things. Not always, but sometimes. Making it personal. If we make it personal, the question will often shift from what do we do with this child to what do I want done? What would I want done if this was my child? So when I was principal at Cherbourg, there are some times, you know, when I knew if I had to meet with parents, um, I would sometimes stare myself in the mirror on the way out, knowing that they were grumpy with me about whatever. But just knowing that the reason they were there was because they loved their child and they wanted the best for them. But I'd stare myself in the mirror and say, what if this was my own big sister I was going to talk to about my nephews and nieces? How would I want her spoken to? What sort of outcomes would I want from this conversation? Um, when I'm thinking about the quality of teachers in particular classrooms, the question for me was always, would I let this teacher teach my child? And if the answer was no, then why the hell would I let anybody else be subjected to a lesser quality teacher that I'd never considered good enough for my own? It's quite a simple message. There it is again, high expectations, relationships. And again, if you think I'm trying to emphasize a word there, you might be right. Although it looks better here than it does up there. I want to just make a point about high expectations, relationships versus zero tolerance. Because see, if I'm a teacher 
and I say the assignments have to be in by 9 o'clock on Monday morning. And if they're not, that's it. It's all over. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I've set the bar high. And if they don't jump over that bar, then, then too bad. Now, one could argue that that's high expectations. But I would argue to you that that's not a high expectations relationship. Because if the assignment has to be in by 9 a.m. on Tuesday on Monday morning, and um, the child turns up and says, well, I haven't got it, sir, because Sissy's in Brisbane and um, she's having a baby and mum's with her and so I've got to look after all the little kids um, and dad's, you know, dad's couldn't, couldn't help us this morning and blah, blah, blah. And if I say no, but if I'm in a relationship with the child and I know what kind of contextual baggage that child carries and I don't have to lower the bar, I can still get that assignment in by 9 a.m. But if I know about what baggage this child carries, then the previous Monday, I might just go and check on him and say, hey, the assignment's coming up. How are you travelling with that? Because I know your mum's away uh, and your sister's away. How's that going, by the way? I bet you're looking forward to having a little brother or sister. Um, but let's talk about this assignment because it's due next Monday and I want to make sure you get it in. That is a high expectations relationship. Make sense? The Stronger Smarter Approach has worked in other, other parts. So we started off with one school in Sherbrooke and transforming that, and I had a direct hand in that. Um, but we've been able to take the Stronger Smarter Approach and have it applied in all sorts of other schools with all sorts of people. People would say to me, oh, well, you can, you can do that because you're an Aboriginal man or, or those sorts of things. But in truth, it had nothing really to do with being an Aboriginal or being a, a man but it had every, everything to do with being in a position of authority and executing that authority within the context of a high expectations relationship and making my work personal and refusing to collude with that negative stereotype that we put up there before. Here are some others. I'm not going to dwell on these too much. This is a school in Victoria. Enrolment's increasing by 80%. That's not too bad. This is a school in, um, not far from here, in Orange, New South Wales. Uh, the principal there is a, a, a very beautiful, a big white lady called Jane Cameron, who's, um, who just wanted to be the best principal that she could be. And she said, as she describes her school, it was on the wrong side of the railway tracks, and so people would write it off. Uh, but people like Jane and, and others have proven absolutely that, um, that yes, the context can make things difficult, um, but it's never ever impossible that transformation can occur. Here's a school way up in Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. So my message again, as I said from the outset, is this is doable, it is happening. So when that dog puts his head, doesn't bother to put his head up or when White Australia says, what's the point or we've tried everything, uh, there's no point. Well, there is some point, you know, because it is happening. There is a reason for hope. We've been able to work right across the Kimberley. This, um, they will remote community school. It's a fantastic little school. I visited it um, some years ago. And to sit in that school and watch those children buzzing, they, they won, there was, I chatted to a young girl who was in year six and she won an art competition and so they took her, her piece of artwork and uh, put it on all of the shampoo bottles and now it appears in uh, international hotels all around the world. Um, but this is one of the most remotest schools in Australia and, um, and when you sit in the classroom you look around and you see this is a school where the intellectual integrity and quality of the classroom is such that it would match any school in Melbourne, uh, the, uh, at the edge of the Melbourne CBD or Sydney or Brisbane or any school. It is, a, it is a school that has intellectual integrity, where teachers are working hard, where nobody's making excuses, and where children, it's a school that children want to turn up to. Some others. As an institute, as I said, we changed, as the Stronger Smarter Institute, we worked in one school, 
So far we've gotten to 350. Uh, we want to take all Australian schools beyond a stronger, smarter tipping point using Gladwell's theory. You know, if we can directly influence 20% of Australian schools, then that's going to be enough to influence the other, the other 80%. So that all Australian schools will appreciate the need to have a um, school culture that, it, that nurtures uh, a positive sense of student identity and cultural identity as opposed to colluding with the negative stereotype, um, embraces positive community la leadership and has high expectations relationships. And so as we move from a sense of hope about a better future for Aboriginal children to one of expectations, my message to you again is we can do this and this is being done in places. And we do not need to resort to these kind of big stick or remedial approaches to plonk on our, on our schools like somehow that's the answer. All we've been asking for all along is good quality leadership, good quality schools and good quality relationships. It's not a lot to ask for. Um, and to do things with us, not, not to us. Acknowledging and building upon our strengths. We kind of know the stuff and it is my absolute belief that teachers right across Australia can make the difference. We have, we have the, the potential and we have the knowledge. Um, we know what we need to know. Sometimes I just don't think we realise it. Maybe we're honest about what gaps need closing and acknowledge that sometimes there are some gaps in here that need closing, not always about there. And may we be connected by our humanity and let our hearts beat more closely together. Because when we let our hearts beat closer together with such proximity, this is where we create scope for a high expectations relationship, for, for a high expectations relationship. This is where we get to make things personal. And this is the stuff that makes a difference. Now I know that might sound a little bit exotic, but this is the very process and the very sort of philosophical approach that enabled us to make that difference way back at Sherbrooke a very long time ago. And when we let our hearts beat more closely together as white Australians and Aboriginal Australians, we become more in tune with the rhythm of this great land that we share. And when we each become more in tune with the rhythm of the land that we share, we can transcend any challenge. Thank you.